Hello and welcome to your next episode of the Eat, Move, Win and the Musings of a Bullshit Queenager podcast. So today's guest is a little bit meta because it's me. So when I started thinking about doing a podcast, it was going to be all about um, the tools, the tricks, the strategies that I use with clients to help them transform their bodies and their mindset and their lives and everything like that. But actually, I realized how much joy I get from talking to other people and about how other women have, you know, either over transform their confidence levels, their bodies, their mind, their careers, everything like that. But I still wanted to make sure that we had something tangible that you guys could take away and implement. And that's what we're going to do today. So today is all about nailing our nutrition um, and our movement with the end goal of losing body fat. Now, I do want to preamble this with this is about permanent transformation um, because changing body composition which means either dropping body fat or increasing muscle mass that can be done fairly easily the actual concept and the actual science behind it is pretty easy but the hard bit is doing it consistently doing it to get results that last um, so that you know you can have a life that you can have a lifestyle you can have habits you can learn to say yes and no to things to you know never hear your have your kids hear you say no mommy's on a diet or mommy's being good or that food's bad and all those really hard boundaries that we put on food and exercise so we're going to be covering nutrition we're going to be covering movement and we're going to be covering mindset and in an ideal world I would get this done in 30 minutes however if you've listened to this podcast before, you know that I love a gab, so it might go on a little bit longer. Now, um, when I speak to clients or women in my free group or friends who are in their 40s, and we, we talk about nutrition quite a lot because everybody knows that that's what I do and that's my bag and I love it. And I love food, like absolutely love food. I love eating, I love socializing, I love having a glass of wine. I hate having boundaries because the minute somebody puts a boundary on me, I'm going to go, uh-uh. You know, if you've ever read the, read about, you know, the shiny red button thing and put a group of toddlers in a room and say, don't press the red button, they're going to press the red button. I'm going to press the red button. So that's one of the, the reasons that I went into this field was to show and help people that they can have this really healthy, sustainable and realistic approach to food and exercise without it being all-encompassing. So, but when we talk about healthy nutrition, some things are always said, you know, it doesn't matter the audience, it doesn't matter the person or what they do for a job or anything like that. These come across each and every time. So number one, that it's overwhelming. Healthy nutrition is overwhelming. And I completely say that because if you scroll through your social media feed, you'll get presented with a shit ton of things, you know. Oh, metabolic diets, um, overcome your insulin resistance with this one food, um, vegan, keto, intermittent fasting, 800 calorie diet, juice plus. We don't really see Herbalife as much anymore because it's utter shite. Um, you know, we get loads of stuff. Even if you go to Tesco and look at the books, you know, it's all this 800 calorie fasting keto diet, which quite frankly boils my piss. Um, but there's a lot of noise. So we don't actually know what is right. And the sexier and more clickbaity it sounds, the more desirable it is. And that's a whole, that's a whole other marketing thing. We can, we can have another podcast on that one. Um, and the other thing that is really common is that it's healthy nutrition is unrealistic. For most women now, if you're if you've got kids and you you work four hours a week and you've got um, life stuff to do, you know you keep your house in order. You've got pets. You've got to still do your own exercise. You've still got to figure out when the kids are going to all their clubs and whatnot. So when we see some of these things, and one of the ones that I can't remember the guy's name, but it was like an uber clean low no processed cook everything from scratch type thing and it sounds really attractive you're like yeah if I could just eat everything really clean and um cook everything from fresh yeah of course that makes sense you know we probably all could do with eating more less processed foods um but if you are constantly being presented with food and recipes that require these obscure 
uh, ingredients or, you know, that require even to soak your chickpeas for 48 hours. You know, for most people, that's not really going to happen, is it? You know, yes, we should probably all be better at planning and preparing food so that we have less choice when we get to a point of we're tired or we're overworked or we're stressed. Um, but asking people to soak their mung rates for 48 hours and go out into the sea and catch their own bloody fish um, and go outside and pluck their own chickens, you know, that's taking it to the extreme. But where you have to go to specialist supermarkets, you know, I live fairly rurally you know it's a small town on the outskirts of a small town we don't have I can't just nip to the shop and get well my local shop I can't even go and get microwaveable popcorn so you know we've got to be we've got to have an approach that works for people and their lifestyles the other thing about nutrition that always comes across is that people only look at it when they want to lose weight and healthy eating is just another word for I'm trying to lose weight and that is not the case at all yet Nutrition is hugely beneficial for fat loss, but there is so, so, so much more than that. And we're going to cover off some of that today. Um, eating healthily sounds boring. It really does sound boring. Um, eating consistently well sounds boring. Uh, eating in a realistic way for your lifestyle also sounds boring. So I can completely see, you know, I need to get back better at marketing and find a way of presenting consistent, realistic um less is more progress not perfection better not best and get that turned around into something that's a bit more clickbaity because you know cure your metabolism or um manage your glucose levels manage your insulin blah, 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 right it all sounds very sexy and all like woo, that sounds amazing but in actual fact that's not what anybody needs um so yeah i need to get better but you know healthy eating doesn't need to be boring we've got this we see we probably all follow like extremely lean people on social media. They're like, yeah, I just eat chicken, rice and broccoli for three meals of the day. You're like, yep, that sounds disgusting. Um, and, you know, if you're trying if you're trying to be healthy, you can't drink or you can't eat crisps or you can't go out for a meal. And these are all things that everybody likes to do. You know, well, most people like to do. And the other thing about healthy eating is there's a perception that it's, that it's really hard to do. And I'm going to show you today that it's really not. So if they're the things that people assume to be true about healthy nutrition, what is actually true? So in real life, healthy nutrition is about consistency. It's not about perfection. You know, anybody who has done any kind of healthy eating plan or they've been on a diet knows that they can be very rigid and strict with themselves for a very short amount of time. And then they get really beat up about the fact that they're not motivated to keep it going. And in actual fact, it's nothing to do with motivation. You know, nobody is motivated in the long term. Most people get um, extrinsic, externally motivated. So, you know, if you, if you hire a coach or if you're um, doing a program or you're training for a marathon or you're training for a competition of some description, you are, real, you are using that external force to motivate you. But that can't be done long term. That's not lifelong motivation. If we want to do something consistently well, we have to rely on intrinsic motivation. And that means we are driven internally. And even then, being motivated isn't something that anybody can sustain for a long period of time. So that's why we have to look at consistency of habits, because when things are habit and they are consistent, you will then start to do them on autopilot. So it means you don't have to rely on motivation. Um, I hope that makes sense. Now, in real life, nutrition is all about fueling your body correctly so it can perform at its best. Now, everybody's version of that is different, but I can't think of one person who doesn't want to have um, sustainable physical energy where they're not flagging at four o'clock in the afternoon. We, we have got, if you're in your 40s, you're probably about halfway through your life. You have got so much more that you can do. So we want to be physically able to do that. And things happen to our body as we get older, our metabolism slows down, our muscle mass deteriorates, our bone density deteriorates, our collagen levels start to disintegrate. You know, they've got all these things that are naturally happening. And these are all natural parts of aging. But if we want to perform at its best, we're going to give ourselves as much help as we possibly can. Another thing about nutrition 
is that it's a way of sharing social and cultural events. Like, you know, Christmas isn't going to be Christmas if you're not having a Baileys at seven o'clock in the morning or you're not having uh, turkey sandwiches at nine o'clock at night. You know, we do these things to bond and connect with people and constantly ostracizing yourself away from social events or cultural events because you're not eating that or you're not doing that can be quite damaging um, in terms of the relationships that we've got, but also internally, like we get that feeling of missing out and that we can't do things. Um, and healthy, true healthy nutrition shouldn't have ridiculous rules round about it. Sorry, I just need to stop and take a wee drink. You know, we, when we apply these rules, when we're following rules, we feel quite good, don't we? We feel like we're in control. But what happens with most, certainly the women in my audience, because we all tend to be a little bit control freakery, um, is when we break the rule or we don't do the rule, we kind of, it's like, oh, well, I've screwed it all up now. I just throw it all away and I've balls it. Can't do this. Um, and that's, you know, that's part and parcel of the whole psychology around trying to follow strict rules. Um, and we shouldn't have ridiculous rules around food, you know, food and movement and living as just part of our natural living. So putting strict rules around it is never going to work long term. And probably this is one thing that people kind of forget about nutrition is that it is probably the biggest tool you have to future proof your health and your hormone levels. And one of the things of late has been a lot of talk about HRT and how HRT is going to be the wonder cure for everything. It's not. If you, we should never rely on medication or supplements to, to be the one thing. You know, nutrition is something that every single person has in control. They are in control. You can in control what food you put in your mouth, they're in control of the food that you cook, you make, etc. So if you can do that one thing, that is you taking that is the biggest tool you have in your toolkit for optimal health as you get older. And people are a bit like, oh no, no, it's not. Like, oh yes, it is. It absolutely is. So that is healthy nutrition in a nutshell. Now the other big piece about what's important is the things that we have to consider around nutrition. Now, a lot of people listening to this, their goal will be fat loss. And that's absolutely cool. You know, that's part and parcel of what we do. Um, but we have to remember that calories matter. The whole process of fat loss is a scientific equation of calories, which is a unit of energy in that we consume through food versus a unit of energy calories that we expend now if that number if those calories in is the same as the calories out we all maintain our body composition but if we consume more cal calories if we consume more energy than what we are expending that excess energy will get stored as body fat and if that is flipped over and the calories that we expect that we consume are less than the calories we expend we will then use up body fat and it disperses okay so calories matter calories are king when it comes to fat loss but also macros matter especially for us over 40s now women whether it's through you know diet culture or how we're raised macronutrients for women, especially in their 40s, are vital. There's three macronutrients. We've got protein, which is for growing, repairing cells, muscle, etc. We need protein. Carbohydrates are our body's preferred energy source, and fats are vital for hormones and brain health. Now, most women that I have seen that come through my doors are very carb heavy, very low protein and very low fats. So when we start working on, you know, what, what are the issues? Well, I'm overweight, I'm lacking in energy, I've got no get up and go, and I can't be bothered doing anything. Even a slight adjustment in calories, so, so we can start losing body fat by reducing the calories, and we can start adjusting these, these amounts of protein, carbs, and fats so that we get an optimal balance. Now, everybody's different. I'm not going to tell you there is no magic number because everybody's different. But if we start getting the right amount of protein, 
and we start doing the right exercise, our muscle mass is going to grow, which then starts to improve our metabolism. If we start eating more fats, our brain fog could lessen, our concentration could improve, um, our hormonal imbalances, like the the symptoms that we get because of hormone balances could improve. So there's a lot to be said for macros. And when it comes to fat loss, calories are king. That is the science, but macros matter for all the other parts of the issues that my clients come to with us. Now, we tend to forget the basics, get the basics right. So things like, you know, hydration, water, like people actually will roll their eyes when I say get more water in. It's like, oh yeah, it's such a cliche. It is a cliche because it works. So think about perimenopause symptoms, gaining weight, lack of energy, brain fog, lack of concentration, terrible sleep. These are all some of the big hitters, yeah? So if we can, if you think about dehydration, what is the biggest symptom, side effect of dehydration? Brain fog, lack of energy, needing a nap, terrible sleep. So actually... People are like, oh my God, it's my hormones. I need HRT, I need HRT, my hormones. Actually, some people get immediate relief just by drinking two, three liters of water a day. So getting the basics right is so important. And the basics are water, getting some steps in, eating five portions of fruit and veg a day, getting the right amount of protein in, getting the right amount of fiber. You know, these things are common sense. Everybody, every single person does know these things, but it's about implementing them and being accountable to them and doing them consistently that is absolute key um when it comes to um fat loss specifically one thing that we see there's a lot of hormone things that go on when we are dieting right so one of the big things that can happen is is almost psychological but it connects with our hormones so what tends to happen when we go on a diet when we come back to a diet, you know, I'm, I'm going to wait, watch yours, or I'm going to do this 800 calorie keto fasting nonsense. We, our brain goes, oh, she's going on a diet. Oh my God, time to get hungry because it's been so used to being hungry over the years. So what then can happen is that that can trigger a hormone called ghrelin, which is your hunger hormone, which tells your body you are hungry. So we've got to be mindful that for a lot of people, there is a connection between thinking you're on a diet and actually being physically hungry. So it's just something to be very mindful of that when you start, if you are in a place where you want to change your body composition, that you are thinking of it as a long-term solution and not as a quick fix diet, because that's gonna, it's not gonna set you up for success, that way of thinking. Um, two big things when we're considering nutrition, especially in perimenopause, is that it's person-centered, i.e., you know, who are you? What do you do? What time do you have available? What is your lifestyle like? How many kids have you got? How many hours are you out of the house? How much time do you have to prep? All these things. And we are creating a really family-friendly, food-friendly approach to your life. Now, I bet we've all done diets where it's like you have to follow these ridiculous rules, which you can't do because it's doesn't it's not in line with either your values or your lifestyle but when you start looking at doing things that work around your lifestyle it makes it as easy as possible and we want to keep, create less friction the less friction there is the easier it is to implement um, and that might mean you know letting go of all these ridiculous rules where we can't eat carbs and we can't drink wine and we can't eat crisps and we can't um, even look at a cake because long term that doesn't fit in with somebody's lifestyle so looking at less rules and more balance is absolutely vital. So that's your nutrition. Biggest tool you have, biggest controllable you have. And there was some really quick things that you can do in there that is going to make changes within the next few days for you. But when we look at movement, now, for some reason, I'm not sure why this is, but people come to me and they're like, oh, I go to the gym five times a week and nothing's happening. I'm not losing any weight, blah, 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 blah. Now, and you might be there yourself. Now, exercise really isn't the thing for fat loss it really is not the thing it doesn't really do an awful lot for fat loss it's a it's it has a huge amount of benefits and it's absolutely mandatory but not for fat loss but when I talk to people about exercise they tell me the the same things about exercise as they did for food i.e it's overwhelming 
again, go on to your social media page. You've got CrossFit, you've got F45, you've got Pilates, wall Pilates, bar classes, Les Mills, all the things, right? And every single one of them are telling you this is the best thing to do for fat loss in your 40s. But they can't all be right, can they? Like, so it's overwhelming. We don't know where to start. Again, it's unrealistic to achieve for busy women. Oh, right. If you want to lose weight, if you want to have more energy, you're going to have to run a marathon. Like five hours a week of running training is a huge commitment and not one that most people can do if they want to be juggling a career or a business and a family and a dog and all the rest of it. Right. So not very many people can do that. And not many people want to do that either, speaking for myself. But, you know, we've got to be look at somebody as an individual, not what as a blanket approach. Again, people say exercise is a tool for lose weight, and it's absolutely not. It really isn't. Um, exercise is boring and it's hard. Now, exercise can be boring for some people. Like I find running exceptionally boring. The thought of training for a marathon wants to make me eat my own arm. But I love weightlifting. So I found something that I really love to do. Some people hate exercise and feel stopped. They thought of going to the gym makes them go out in a cold sweat. This is where it's important to look at you as a person. What do you like to do? What can you stick to? And for some people, that might mean gardening and lifting up heavy stuff and carrying it over to the other side of the garden and pulling out plants and stuff like that. And with regards to it hurts, you know, we all, we've all had the phrase, no pain, no gain, which is kind of bollocks kind of bollocks um because exercise if you're working your muscles properly it should feel a little bit uncomfortable it shouldn't be painful uncomfortable and knowing that it's going to stop soon is the kind of the mantra to think there so if it is painful and you are like going oh, I can't do this it's, it's so hard like you potentially could be injured so make sure you get that checked out but it's just other just something it's really interesting that the same perception about food is the same as exercise and it doesn't have to be that way. So in real life, though, what is actually movement? So it's a way of releasing feel-good hormones and chemicals into the, the system. So you've heard of things like serotonin, dopamine, endorphins, all of these happy chemicals that make us feel good. And now if, I think this is just in Scotland, I'm not sure if it's in England um, and Wales, but if you go to the doctor presenting with, um, symptoms of depression or anxiety or a heightened stress the first protocol now is exercise that's what doctors should be recommending because of these natural ways of releasing these feel-good chemicals so think about exercising as something that helps you feel better and that kind of has a little bit of a motivation to begin with um, it's self-care it's time for you to do you um, you know, some people like to exercise with their children. I do that from time to time. But, uh, you know, it's nice just to have something for you. Um, exercise is a way of speeding up your slow metabolism. Um, so I mentioned that our muscle mass starts to deteriorate as we get older. We can speed that back up again by growing more muscle because um, our body uses more energy to fuel muscle mass than it does everything else. So if you've got more muscle mass, your body is expanding, is using some of those calories, that energy that we talked about earlier. So it's a good place to start. Your own body actually working with you to burn body fat. Um, functional fitness is something that is about being active in real life. So functional fitness, you might have heard the term, but basically that is just being fit and doing things that will replicate into real life scenarios. So if you're doing an overhead press or a shoulder press with dumbbells or barbells or sandbags or kettlebells or whatever, that replicates you putting something heavy in the cupboard. Um, if you think about carrying, you know, see some people carrying dumbbells and kettlebells, heavy ones, you know, that replicates you carrying the shopping bags from the shop to the car uh, or up the path. Being able to squat is your ability to pick something up from the ground. You know, there's loads of things that we do for exercise that are replication of real life movements that we want to keep. Like, me, certainly for me, one of my whys about why I stay fit and healthy is because I want to get to my 70s, 80s and be able to pick things up off the ground, be able to put things in the covers, to be able to be independent and active and still be able to move. And that's why we should maybe look at exercise rather than just at exercise for fat loss. Um, 
when we're doing resistance training, i.e. picking up things, heavy things, that is helping to improve our bone density. So you'll heard of osteoporosis, which is, you know, the kind of end result of weakened bone density where we get easy bone, bone breakage. We can protect against that by doing resistance training. So it's so important to see and do exercise as a tool for long-term health, mobility, and agility, rather than just as a, I need to go to the gym because I ate too many crisps. Um, and a phrase that I like, and this isn't mine, but I stole it from a physio, is motion is lotion. So the more that we can move, the more lubricated our joints are going to be. And that is a positive thing for our long-term health. So let's think about the consideration. So we want more muscle. It's getting the health, getting muscle is not going to make you look like a man. You know, weightlifting is not going to make you look like a man. The only way that you'll get really masculine if you're weightlifting is if you are taking a performance enhancing steroid, which most people are not going to be doing. They're just going to be taking their, their normal medications and supplements and they're not going to get ripped. That's not going to happen. Okay, most women, women don't have that amount of testosterone to be able to grow physiques like that. Um, so movement with resistance training is going to speed up your metabolism. It's going to help you to lose fat. It's going to help you to be, you know, more active, more doing things. Can't think of the word right now. Brain fog, you see, should drink more water. Um, it's going to help increase your bone density. It's going to help improve your respiratory and cardiac health, helps your mental health. And remember, it's going to make you live long and healthy and be mobile. You know, these things are so, so, so important. Um, there's a, a bit of an argument, not an argument, that's wrong. Um, there's always an ongoing uh, debate about what's better. Should I be doing cardio or should I be doing resistance training? Right, so first factor is start at the beginning, like do what you want to do, do what you like to do, do what you can stay consistent at. Um, because if you hate going to the gym, but you like running, then going running is going to be significantly better than sitting on your arse doing nothing. If you like weightlifting, but you hate running, go to the gym and lift some weights. Running is just going to make you miserable. There are benefits to both. Now, running is never going to get you any muscle mass. Never, ever, 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 ever. And weightlifting is probably not going to improve your respiratory or your cardiac health all that much because your heart rate is not increasing that much. So you probably want to have a little bit of both. So, you know, and a good way of looking at this could be I'm doing, I'm lifting weights, I'm doing resistance training two or three times a week and I've got something in there, either, you know, a march on the treadmill really quick or in an incline for 10 minutes at a time or I'm going for a run once a week. You know, things that are impacting every part of your body so there you go right the other thing that we need to look at for especially for our generation and these are the things that we tend to miss out on sleep quality and quantity if you're not sleeping enough you're going to have an increased appetite you're going to be more susceptible to cravings um, your energy overall energy levels are going to dip it's going to impact your hair it's going to impact your skin your digestion your mood and also, lack of sleep is going to increase your cortisol levels, which stops your body from being in balance. Like our bodies like balance. And if you've got too much of one thing, it doesn't like it at all. So when you've got too much cortisol, your, it means it's going to impact on things like your metabolism. So it's going to say, right, you're stressed. I don't really know why you're stressed, whether it's because you're not getting enough sleep or you're getting chased by lions. So... I'm not going to bother losing any fat because that doesn't really matter right now if you're getting chased by lions. So we want our bodies to have natural, nice levels of cortisol, good quality sleep. You know, we're talking seven plus hours here. So if you're surviving on five hours sleep, it is not enough, not enough. And you might be all, oh, I'm fine with five hours sleep. You might be fine, but you're not optimal. And you know, very much we get into a habit of not sleeping enough. We also get into a habit of being quite proud of the fact that we don't sleep enough. Start retraining yourself so you can get another half hour, 15 minutes sleep, half hour sleep, whatever. Small increments are going to work better. Um, and the other thing I want to consider about exercise and nutrition is that 
we need to lose this sense of, well, I've done it for a day. Why haven't I noticed results? <laughs> Consistency and patience. The two of the most boring words in the English language, totally get it, but the most underrated when it comes to getting healthy. Consistency and patience. We need both. And an understanding of how fat loss actually works because it's not linear. It's not going to be a, you do these things for three days and you're going to lose half a stone. That's not how it works. We have to get used to the fact that hormone changes mean that the scales will fluctuate. What we eat day to day will change the number in the scales. So it's not just about the number in the scales. It's about the actual loss of fat, which we can track through our measurements that we can track through our clothes and our photos. Okay. Now, this is the bit where people are like, oh God, my mindset's fine. Or people go, my mindset's terrible. But then it gets a bit scary because we're like, oh my God, does that mean I need some psychoanalyst? Or do I need like a psychologist or need some therapy? Mindset, just think about mindset. So if you think about exercise as physical conditioning, you know, conditioning work. Mindset work is just mental conditioning. And basically the role within coaching is to help people do things that they've never done before or they've not been able to do before. And that's what mindset work is all about. So the whole point about mindset is about changing, for us, it's about changing subconscious behaviors. Now, everybody has subconscious behaviors about they do things because that's how they were raised or that's what they believe to be true or um, that's what they were told to do in the past. But in actual fact, those things might not be serving us. So there's a lot of there's some pro like actual defined processes that we use about underpinning new behaviors, new habits, and new ways of doing things that help us do things consistently and with patience that are all mindset related. We, we call it in our work. Um, but things like we need to look at self-confidence, we need to look at self-esteem, we need to look at the things that we do, like our current subconscious beliefs and behaviors and change them and looking at patterns that maybe don't serve us anymore and changing them as well. Um, and these things all then connect to things like stress levels, hormones, sleep quality, because um, it's, all, it's all linked, all of this stuff. So if you imagine three cogs, um, you've got a cog with nutrition, a cog with movement and exercise and a cog with mindset. If one of those cogs stops, the other two cogs are never going to work properly. So that's why it's really important to do all of these things, get your nutrition right, get your movement right, and get your mindset right. Because when you get those three working together, that's when the results come. That's when it becomes normal, when it becomes permanent, when it becomes consistent. With, and you do start doing things without realizing you're doing it. And that's the holy grail. That is the end result that we're trying to achieve here. Um, and understanding that we have different motivators. Every single person has got a different motivator. Everybody, every single person has got different goals. Everybody, every single person has got different blockers, different challenges. You know, some people suffer from self-sabotage. Some people are susceptible to sabotage from third parties. Some people start getting results and then get scared and, you know, go, ah, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, there's so many different things that we need to break down and unpick. And that is all something that happens at an individual level. But first and foremost, I want you to understand that there is a process and the process works. And you don't necessarily have to understand the process, but understand that there is a process um, and that me and people like me who are good coaches and who do get good results, they have fine-tuned that process. And that's important. It's not just throwing you know, calorie numbers at you. It's not just throwing an exercise plan at you. There is layers of what we do to get the results. And if you think back to the cogs, to get all those cogs oiled up and working creek free, that is that is the journey, okay? So um, how do you do all this in real life? So I'm going to read out a few things that you every, every single person can do today. We might not be able to do them all today. But every single person can do, and if you do these consistently, if you do these over a longer period of time, then results will come, okay? So drinking more water, two and a half to three litres of water every single day. Caffeine doesn't count in that. Alcohol doesn't count in that. Um, and you will find that you will piss like a racehorse, 
that is okay. It will calm down after about a week, but be consistent with it. Because if you stop drinking your water on a Friday, come Monday when you start drinking your water again, you'll be peeing like a resource again. So keep it consistent. Um, I want everybody to get outside and move more, even if it is just 10 minute walk, 50 minute walk, 20 minute walk, whatever. Get outside smell the air look at the trees listen to the birds you know that's kind of a two in one you're getting your movement and we call things like walking called NEAT which stands for non-exercise activity thermogenesis which for fat burn we actually lose more fat by doing NEAT than we do by doing formalized exercise so get outside and get moving just walking fine go um resistance training that is not hit that is not body pump or body attack resistance training doing you know slower sets of weightlifting kettlebells dumbbells bags of dog food toddlers it doesn't matter but doing that two or three times a week is really going to help um engage your muscles it's really going to help you um start working your muscles so that it, they respond then to the increased protein that i'm going to get you to do um so that you can increase your metabolism protect your bone density, live longer and happier and healthier. Um, more protein is going to help repair and grow that muscle mass. Um, and in conjunction with that strength training, that resistance training, it's going to help increase your metabolism as well. Look at your quality of food. So fruit and veg, minimum five portions every single day. You're going to, your skin is going to thank you. Your hair is going to thank you. Your energy levels are going to thank you. Digestive system is going to thank you. Uh, and I want you to eat this fruit and veg, not drink it, eat it. There's a whole biological process that happens the minute you put food near your face that releases all these enzymes in your saliva that then helps your digestive system and digestive tract process all the food. So eat your food. Um, look at the quality of your fats. So if you're, I'm thinking here, less Greg's yum yums and more olives good quality fats from your olives, avocados, um, from things like your oily fish, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not saying yum yums are bad. They're obviously not optimally healthy, but you know, let's be realistic. You can't eat yum yums all day, every day and expect to feel healthy. Um, fiber is another thing. Most women in the UK do not get enough fiber. And the more fruit and veg you eat, the more fiber you're going to get. It's a, it's a nice wee trade there. Um, learn to de-stress without using alcohol or stimulants. You know, we all want to do some self-care, but self-care is about giving your body and your mind what it needs to thrive. And more often than not, Netflix and a bottle of, bottle of Malbec is not going to do that. Yeah, once in a while, absolutely necessary. But be mindful it's not particularly self-care okay so learn to de-stress without alcohol make sleep part of your self-care routine rely less on convenience and processed foods that's going to help reduce inflammation in the body as well as all these other positive health implications and when you do all this you're going to notice things like you'll have less fatigue you'll have better concentration you'll have less bloating uh, your skin will feel and look better your hair will look and feel better lose a few pounds um, and when you do all of that, it starts giving you confidence that you're doing the right things. Um, but the biggest takeaway I can give you is this. You have to do something to get something different. So if you're listening to this and just going, yeah, that's all very well and good. I'm going to do nothing about that. Then you're not going to see any changes. Be prepared to make changes. And these things that I've just read through there, you don't have to do all of them today, you know, do one of them for a few days, do another one for a few days, you know, building things slowly and consistently into lifestyle is going to get much bigger results down the line than trying to do everything for three days and then giving up because it's too hard. All right. So make sure that you are taking action. That's the main thing. As always, if you do have any questions or you need help on any of these, how to implement it, how to take action, how if you need accountability to do it, just get in touch using the details in the show notes. So I hope this has all made sense and given you some food for thought, literally. Um, I did not get this under 30 minutes. I did try, failed miserably. But thank you for listening. I really do appreciate it.